I'm, I'm delighted, uh, if not a bit anxious, to be back in a building where I took so many courses as an undergraduate and so many final exams. Uh, my task this afternoon is to make the case that we must begin using a medical model in our efforts to protect the global environment. I've been asked to be provocative and to limit my provocation to 10 minutes. I will try my best to do both. In 1980, with three other Harvard faculty members, I started an organization called the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. In 1985, we won the Nobel Peace Prize. I'm that guy with the hair holding the prize. <laughs> the most important contribution of the tens of thousands of physicians who were eventually part of this federation was to help people grasp what a nuclear war would really be like so that they knew that these weapons were so catastrophically destructive that they could not be used in wartime, and so that they would do everything in their power to prevent a nuclear war from occurring. And we did this by translating the abstract technical science of nuclear weapons explosions that world-class scientists like Henry Kendall and George Kistiakowsky and others had been talking about for decades into the concrete personal terms of human health, into everyday language that people could relate to and understand. Namely, what would really happen to us in such a war? We talked about skull fractures instead of the jewels of force in the explosion, about third degree burns instead of the number of degrees centigrade in the fireball, about radiation sickness instead of the REMS and the fallout. And as a result of these concrete stories, I believe we helped make nuclear war more real for people. We made it harder for them to think about such wars in vague, abstract terms. And in the process, perhaps, we helped change public opinion and maybe even public policy about the use of these weapons. But in contrast to nuclear weapons explosions, changes to the global environment like climate change are much harder to grasp. We have no Hiroshima's or Nagasaki's to serve as models, as concrete examples of what will happen. Global environmental changes can also be very hard to see. They occur slowly or intermittently and on global scales. They can be obscured by normal fluctuations in things like temperature and rainfall. Our brains are wired to see what is happening right now in front of us. We don't do very well with seeing things that happen incrementally or that occur over large areas or in other parts of the world. And the task of grasping these changes is made much more difficult because there's such a fundamental misunderstanding that many people have about the environment, believing that we human beings are separate from it, that it exists outside of us, and so many are not terribly worried about our degrading the atmosphere and the oceans and soils, as if these changes will have no effect on us whatsoever, almost as if they were happening someplace other than where we all live. Because many scientists who speak to policymakers and the public often do so in technical, jargon-filled language that most people cannot follow, we scientists are mostly trained to talk to one another, a problem which is becoming more and more acute as science becomes more specialized. And because there has been such a widespread, well-funded, highly effective campaign, much as there was by the tobacco industry, to cast doubt on the science of global environmental change and to discredit the scientists. And now, as in all of my opinions this evening, I'm speaking for myself and myself alone, not the Center for Health and the Global Environment that I run at Harvard Medical School, not for Harvard or for anyone or any institution associated with the Center in any way. I want to say here how important it is to speak about what one strongly believes to be true, especially when the stakes are so high, as they surely are now. And this campaign that I mentioned designed to make people mistrust the world's leading scientists about the issue of climate change by claiming that they have deliberately misrepresented the science. This campaign of disinformation 
has been funded but with tens of millions of dollars by such corporations and individuals as ExxonMobil and the brothers David H. and Charles C. G. Koch and others who want us all to burn as much oil and gas and coal as possible without any legal restrictions or hesitation whatsoever. This campaign has been supported by politicians and right-wing think tanks who have all received very large sums of money from these same sources, and it has been disseminated by some in the media like Rush Limbaugh and Fox News and the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, which together reach tens of millions of people with their junk science. So it is no surprise that large sections of the public in this country now falsely believe that there is a great debate going on in the scientific community, which there is not, about whether human beings are responsible for warming the planet and causing extreme, increasingly unstable, and catastrophically destructive changes to the global climate. So that's my first point, that global climate change and other changes to the global environment are too technical and complicated and abstract for most people to grasp, and therefore they are highly vulnerable to having the wool pulled over their eyes by vested interest, lulled into believing that these changes that are occurring are natural cycles and that scientists aren't all that concerned about them. And so, as was true with the issue of nuclear war, we must help educate people about what is really happening to the environment in language that they can relate to and understand. And there's no more compelling way to do this, in my view, than to talk about human health. That's why we formed the center. That's why I'm here today. Let me give you another example of using a medical model. Polar bears, these magnificent creatures, the Earth's largest land carnivores, evolved about the same time as our species did, some 195,000 years ago. It is predicted that they will be extinct in the wild by the end of this century, if not before, largely because of global warming and the melting of the Arctic ice sheet, which leads to their inability to capture seals, their main food. Seals can come up for air in areas of free water and elude capture by polar bears, so they're starving. Polar bears have become iconic figures in discussions about what we will lose if we don't re reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. Adorable polar bear cubs are on every environmental poster, and people are heartbroken by their expected loss. But the medical value of polar bears is almost never mentioned. Let me tell you about this. Like all bears that hibernate, like these brown bears, polar bears are essentially immobile for five to seven months or more, and yet they don't get osteoporosis the loss of bone mass, which every other mammal, including ourselves, gets as a result of prolonged immobility. We lose a third or more of our bone mass after five months of being immobile. Osteoporosis is an enormous public health problem, especially for the inactive elderly, particularly for postmenopausal women. And while we can help reduce its impact by exercising, taking calcium, vitamin D, and certain medicines, we cannot replace bone once it has been lost. Bears also don't eat, drink, urinate, or defecate for the months they are hibernating, and yet they don't become dehydrated, they don't starve, and they don't get sick from not urinating. If we don't urinate for a few days, we die. No one fully understands how bears do this, hibernating bears, but somehow they're able to recycle their urinary waste, break them down, turn them into amino acids, and make new proteins. More than 26 million Americans have chronic kidney disease, many of whom go on to kidney failure. There is no treatment for kidney failure other than dialysis or kidney transplantation. Finally, polar bears become massively obese on seal blubber prior to hibernating, but they don't get type 2 diabetes as we do when we become massively obese. This is also not well understood. Obesity-related type 2 diabetes, which is essentially epidemic in the United States and around other parts of the world, and is expected to increase dramatically as rates of obesity skyrocket in coming decades, causes some one quarter of a million deaths in the United States each year. 
with the loss of polar bears, which must be studied in the wild, as bears don't hibernate in zoos, we may lose with them the secrets they hold that could allow us to treat and possibly even prevent three largely untreatable diseases, osteoporosis, kidney failure, and obesity-related type 2 diabetes that kill more than 400,000 people in this country every year and cost our economy more than $140 billion. That's what global climate change and the melting of Arctic ice really means. Finally, I want to talk about the role of evidence and proof in medicine. In making a medical diagnosis, a physician relies on genetics, the present and past history, a physical exam, lab tests, imaging studies like x-rays and CAT scans. Unlike in science, where one tries to prove a hypothesis, in medicine, it is rarely possible to have enough evidence to establish a proof before one has to act. Decisions are made based on an accumulated body of evidence, and the urgency of making them is based on the degree of risk involved. The greater the risk, the less evidence one needs. This is the precautionary principle in practice, something physicians must deal with every day. If a child less than one month old shows up at a hospital with a fever of more than 100.4 degrees, he or she is immediately put on two broad spectrum antibiotics. After blood, urine, and cerebrospinal fluid, the fluid that bathes the brain and spinal cord, are drawn for bacterial cultures. One doesn't wait until the cultures come back two days later before starting treatment. One can't afford to wait, for in that two days time, a bacterial infection could spread rapidly through the infant's body and kill it. More than 90% of fevers in infants are in fact caused by viruses, not bacteria. And only a fraction of those that are caused by bacteria go on to cause serious problems or death. But the risk of not starting antibiotics immediately on all the infants that show up with fever is much too great. For by not doing so, one takes the risk that one or more of them will become dangerously ill and may die. This is a risk no pediatrician is willing to take. This is the model we need to use for making decisions about reducing greenhouse gas emissions and addressing other changes to the global environment. The risks of inaction and delay are so enormous, so potentially catastrophic for the planet, not just for now, but for hundreds and perhaps thousands of years to come, that to wait to act until we have absolute proof, absolute certainty of what will happen is to take a risk with the physical, chemical, and biological systems of the planet and with our health and our lives that no one should ever take. The historic heat waves and fires like those last year in Russia that killed more than 15,000 people and destroyed a third of its wheat crop the dramatic increase in torrential rain, storms, and flooding all over the world, like what is happening in Bangkok right now, the death of millions of acres of pine and spruce forests in western states and in Canada and Alaska, the bleaching and death of coral reefs in tropical oceans, the growing areas of drought and famine in many parts of the world, like in the Horn of Africa, which is currently threatening millions with starvation, the melting of glaciers all over the world, compromising the water supply for tens of millions of people, the rise in sea levels, inundating croplands in places like the Nile Delta and Bangladesh, and submerging low-lying islands in the Pacific and Alaska. All these changes attributed to human-caused climate change have occurred with an average warming of the Earth's surface of only about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit since the end of the 19th century when we began to burn fossil fuels in vast quantities during the Industrial Revolution. Projections by the world's leading scientists are that if we do not slow down and turn around our current emission rates of CO2, that global mean surface temperatures could increase by an additional eight or more degrees Fahrenheit for a total of close to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that doesn't sound like much, 
So let me tell you how enormous this rise it really is. The amount of warming as measured by global mean surface temperatures from 18,000 years ago, the end of the last ice age, when there was a glacier more than one mile thick right on top of where you are sitting this evening to now is only about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. How have we gotten here? How can we as a country continue to behave like people in a dream, in a trance, virtually silent as all the Republican candidates for president but John Huntsman deny the threat of climate change, largely silent as our own Congress has refused to address what the major academies of medicine around the world have warned is the greatest public health threat of the 21st century, and even our administration has failed to assume a leadership role at the climate talks now going on in Durban. This is certainly not American exceptionalism. Such behavior should be, in my view, an enormous embarrassment, a matter of national shame and disgrace. So I want to leave you with these thoughts. I believe we are all incredibly lucky to be alive at this moment in history, for the changes to the environment I've spoken about are caused by our own behavior. And we have the ability, our generation, especially those of us in the richest, most powerful country on the planet, especially those of us in this room who are among the most privileged and influential members of our society, we have the ability and the responsibility to turn this around. It is up to us. So I urge all of you to learn as much as you can about what is happening to the global environment and to use all of your enormous creativity and intelligence and energy to help educate others, to join those at Harvard and at other academic institutions around the country and the world, other environmental groups, to speak out, to become involved, and for God's sakes, for the sake of your children and grandchildren, for all children to come, to do everything in your power to preserve this wondrous natural world, this in indescribably beautiful and precious gift we have all been given. Thank you.